Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing processing in the histology laboratory. All right, let's get started. Processing in the histopathology laboratory involves the steps of dehydration, clearing, and infiltration of the tissue. So in this lecture, we're going to be discussing all of these processing steps, as well as embedding, decalcification, and frozen sections. We discussed in our fixation and histology lecture that the choice of fixatives should be made at the time of the removal of the tissue, either in surgery or at the time of the autopsy. The same goes for the choice of processing method. The process of dehydration means removing the water from the tissue sample. This is important in two different areas of the histopathology laboratory. The first being the preparation of staining and um, tissue sections uh, for mounting, and the second being the preparation of tissue blocks for embedding in a non-aqueous medium. And when I say the word non-aqueous, I mean a compound that is not liquid. So examples of this include paraffin, uh, saloidin, and certain plastics. Sticks. Water has to be removed from the tissue in order to use these media uh, because the media will not properly infiltrate any tissue that contains water. So this is why dehydration is such an important step in processing. If dehydration is not properly performed, the clearing agent won't be able to work properly and the tissue block will be soft and mushy. We'll talk about clearing agents here in just a bit in this lecture, um, but clearing is the process of replacing the dehydration agent with a chemical that is able to be mixed with paraffin. This is the most common cause of processing problems within the histopathology laboratory. So this is an example of what I was talking about on the previous slide. So this is a bone that was in a block that was not dehydrated properly, resulting in it not being cleared properly. So this caused insufficient infiltration. The white area in the center of this block is soft and mushy, meaning that it was not infiltrated properly with paraffin. Dehydration agents act in two different ways to remove water from the tissue sample. The first way is that some reagents are hydrophilic, and this means that they love water. They mix or dissolve in water. So when a hydrophilic reagent is added, it will attract the water out from the tissue, so out of that tissue. So some dehydrating reagents can act to dehydrate uh, tissue uh, by repeated dilution of the aqueous fluid within the tissue. There are three types of dehydrating agents that are used in the histopathology laboratory. These are alcohols, acetone, and universal solvents. So let's talk about these uh, now. Most dehydrating agents that are used are alcohols. Alcohols do contain some water, and it's important to ensure that the alcohol used as a dehydrating agent um, does not contain any more than 2% water. A, a way to check this is by putting alcohol into either xylene or toluene. Um, if there is turbidity uh, when this mix happens, this indicates that the alcohol uh, contains more than 2% water. Eosin stain is often added to alcohol as a dehydrating agent to dye the tissue a light pink in color. This allows for small biopsy specimens to be more easily identifiable at the uh, tissue embedding station. Ethanol is a clear, colorless, and flammable alcohol. It works quickly and is one of the best dehydrating agents. This is the same alcohol that is used for drinking, so it's controlled by the federal government and requires record keeping. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, mandates the eight uh, hour total weight average permissible exposure limit, or PEL, to 1,000 parts per million. Methanol is a flammable colorless chemical. It is considered poisonous and is not used by self as a dehydrating agent. OSHA mandates the eight hour total weight average uh, PEL of 200 parts per million. This is a chemical that needs to be used with care as overexposure can cause blindness and death. Isopropanol is a great dehydrating agent but is insoluble with eosin stain so it cannot be used in the preparation of staining solutions. It's flammable and is considered a mild irritant. OSHA's PEL for 8 hours is 400 parts per million. Butanol is also a good dehydrating agent although it does require a long time to dehydrate. 
It does cause less shrinkage and hardening of the tissue than ethanol does. OSHA's PEL for eight hours for butanol is 100 parts per million. Acetone can also be used as a dehydrating agent. This is a very quick acting dehydrator and is also less expensive to use. It can cause shrinkage of the tissue and should be used over a dehydrating agent such as dryerite or an anhydrous calcium chloride. Acetone is considered very volatile, meaning it evaporates quickly and is flammable. At the time of this recording, OSHA uh, mandates the eight hour uh, total weight average PEL uh, to 1000 parts per million. Universal solvents are those that perform both the dehydrating step of processing and the clearing step of processing. These are de deoxane, uh, tertiary butanol, and tetrahydrofuran. These are not really suitable for tissue that is delicate. So let's talk about these three universal, universal solvents. Uh, dioxane as a dehydrating agent causes less shrinkage and is faster as a dehydrate, dehydrant uh, than ethanol is. Uh, tissues must spend a long time in dioxane and a large amount must be used um, for the dehydrating process. Uh, dioxane is not frequently used because it is toxic, uh, flammable, and is a carcinogen. So OSHA's eight hour PEL uh, for dioxane is 100 parts per million. Tertiary butanol is another universal solvent. This is a smelly and expensive universal solvent. It does solidify at room temperature. Uh, if it is being used as a dehydrating agent, uh, half tertiary butanol and half paraffin must be used for the first paraffin infiltration. OSHA's eight hour PEL uh, for this is 100 parts per million. Uh, tetrahydrofuran is often considered the best of the universal solvents. It is able to be mixed with other alcohols, water, ether, chloroform, acetone, benzene, toluene, and melted paraffin. It acts quickly and does not cause a lot of shrinkage and hardening of the tissue. It is less toxic than dioxane is and has a, um, an OSHA PEL of 200 parts per million. It is, however, very volatile, meaning it vaporizes easily, and it also needs to be used in a well-ventilated room due to it being known to cause irritation to the eyes. So that is the dehydration part of the histological processing process. So let's talk about clearing now. So the purpose of this is to remove those dehydrating agents from the tissue and prepare that tissue to be impregnated with the embedding agent. Most of the clearing agents cause the tissue to become transparent. Clearing is performed in two different areas of the histopathology laboratory, when processing tissue samples and when staining microscopic tissue sections. Clearing agents are frequently called dealcoholization agents because they serve to remove the alcohol that is used in the dehydration process and allow for the tissue to take up the infiltration medium. They must be miscible with the dehydrating agent and the infiltration medium. And this term means that it can be mixed completely. Like with inadequate dehydration, inadequate clearing will cause soft, mushy tissue. If the tissue is exposed to prolonged time with the clearing agent, it will become hard and brittle. Now the clearing agents used in the histopathology laboratory are xylene, toluene, benzene, chloroform, acetone, essential oils, limonene, and aliphatic hydrocarbons. So the most commonly used clearing agent uh, is xylene. So if tissues are exposed to xylene for prolonged periods of time, it causes hardening of the tissue. Tissues that are especially at risk for over hardening with extended time in xylene are fibrous, uh, muscular, and tissue of uh, the central nervous system, and also are cartilag cartilaginous tissues. Uh, so it's pretty quick acting and leaves the tissue transparent. It is considered both flammable and hazardous as a neurotoxin and cannot be disposed of in the sink. It has an OSHA PEL of 100 parts per million and should be used in a room with appropriate ventilation. Now when xylene is mixed with water, it turns cloudy. So if you ever see xylene cloudy, it needs to be replaced because it's been uh, contaminated with water. Toluene is another clearing agent, um, but it doesn't overharden tissue like xylene does. Uh, the tissue can be left in uh, toluene overnight, unlike xylene. 
This chemical is flammable and becomes vapor quicker than xylene does. It has an OSHA PEL of 50 parts per million. Benzene is a quick acting um, and like toluene doesn't over harden tissue like xylene does. It does tend to harden muscle tissue, tendons and uterine tissue more than toluene does. It vaporizes very quickly from the paraffin bath. So if you are using benzene, it doesn't require changing out as frequently as other clearing agents uh, because it's vaporizing. So benzene shouldn't be used in open processors um, because it is very toxic and it is a carcinogen, uh, meaning it can lead to the development of cancer. It has an OSHA PEL of 10 parts per million. Chloroform penetrates the tissue much slower. It leaves the tissue less brittle than if it was cleared with xylene. It does desiccate uh, connective tissues, but still is a good clearing agent for muscle and uterine tissue, as well as tendon. It vaporizes easily and must be used in closed containers. Uh, chloroform is a clearing agent that actually does not leave the tissue transparent. It's not flammable and not combustible, but it is considered a carcinogen. If chloroform is heated, it can cause a toxic gas to form. Uh, OSHA mandates the PEL for chloroform at 50 parts per million. Acetone can be used as a clearing agent as well. It has a very low boiling point, so it can be boiled off and replaced by paraffin. Because it boils off, the paraffin baths uh, don't become contaminated as easily with acetone. Recall acetone can be used a as a dehydrating agent as well. It does create more shrinkage of the tissue than those cleared with the chemical xylene. Essential oils are easily vaporized clearing agents. These oils are derived from plants and have a strong odor of the plant that uh, they are derived from. Uh, they include cedarwood, clove, origanum, and sandalwood. Uh, they're expensive, so they're not frequently used in the histopathology laboratory. If essential oils are used, they must be removed from the tissue by either xylene or toluene before infiltration. Cedarwood is the most commonly used of the essential oils, which uh, clears quickly and doesn't cause shrinkage of the tissue. Unlike other clearing agent chemicals, cedarwood will clear tissue uh, that has been dehydrated with 95% alcohol. Tissues can remain in cedarwood oil indefinitely as it doesn't harden or damage tissues. Limonene is another uh, clearing agent that is used in the histopathology laboratory. Uh, these have a very distinct citrusy odor to them. It is considered an irritant and can cause allergic reactions if re uh, repeatedly exposed. It does harden tissue less than xylene does, uh, but does cause more contamination of the paraffin. And because of this, the paraffin must be changed out more frequently if using limonene as a clearing agent. Aliphatic hydrocarbons, also called alkanes, are clearing agents that are low in both reactivity and toxicity. Their 8-hour PEL is 300 uh, parts per million and are generally considered non-irritating. There are two subclasses of aliphatic hydrocarbons uh, divided based on the length of the chain of the molecule. The lightweight or short chain aliphatic hydrocarbons are used in histology because they are able to penetrate tissue samples quicker, remove fat effectively, and do not interfere with cover slipping. They are not great with water and because of this are incompatible with some mounting media. Aliphatic hydrocarbons are less aggressive than xylene, and because of this, their methods of processing are uh, more critical. Uh, to do this, three stations of clearing agent on the tissue processor must be used. The three stations at three minutes each are used to de-paraffinize the tissue sections. Uh, alcohols and eosin must be rotated carefully, um, and the anhydrous alcohol must be kept dry, and the mounting medium must be applied to the cover slip and lowered down at an angle and upside down over the cover slip. Okay, so we've now talked about the dehydration and the clearing steps of processing. After these steps are completed, the tissue must be infiltrated with a supporting medium. So this is usually called an embedding medium and it helps to hold the intercellular structures of the tissue in their proper relationship uh, while the tissue is cut. 
the infiltration or embedding medium that we are going to be talking about are um, paraffin, water soluble waxes, soloidin, plastics, agar and gelatin, and 30% sucrose. The most popular embedding medium is paraffin wax. Large numbers of tissue blocks may be processed in a short time, and it allows for routine and special staining. Paraffin wax is fairly inert. Paraffin wax can be bought commercially, um, and these commercially purchased paraffin waxes contain additives like beeswax, rubber, plastics, and other waxes. So when added, beeswax reduces the size of any crystals of present and increases the stickiness and adhesion of the wax. Rubber, when added, helps to reduce brittleness, increase the stickiness, and allows the formation of ribbons easier. Plastics, when added to paraffin, increase the support and hardness. And when other waxes are added to the paraffin wax, it helps to produce a smoother texture and smaller crystal size. The properties of paraffin wax vary with its melting point. As its melting point increases, the wax becomes harder, thus providing better support for tissue that is hard. This allows thinner sections to be cut, but ribboning becomes more difficult. And we'll talk more about ribboning in our instrumentation lecture. As its melting point decreases, the paraffin becomes more soft and thus provides less support for harder tissues. Thinner sections become more challenging to cut, but ribboning becomes easier. Paraffin wax with a melting point of 55 to 58 degrees Celsius is the most commonly used. For immunohistochemistry samples that are done with paraffin embedding medium, a lower melting point paraffin is used because heat can inactivate the antigens in the sample. Because of the heat causing shrinkage and hardening, tissue should not remain in paraffin wax for extended periods of time. The supply of melted paraffin should be kept between 2 to 4 degrees Celsius above the melting point. If tissue is exposed to paraffin wax that is overheated, it will overharden. The containers holding the melted paraffin must be rotated routinely with frequent changes of fresh paraffin. Three changes of paraffin are recommended for proper infiltration. The last change of paraffin wax should have no odor of the clearing agent that was used. Paraffin infiltration is aided by vacuum. Care needs to be taken when processing very small tissue specimens since it can be uh, prone to over hardening of the tissue. Biopsy specimens should be processed overnight on an open processing cycle without the use of heat or vacuum. There are three different protocols that can be used for paraffin embedding. Protocol 1 utilizes an open system without vacuum. Protocol 2 utilizes a closed system with both heat and vacuum. And Protocol 3 utilizes vacuum only using the heat when used with paraffin. So let's talk about these different protocols. So this is an example of a routine overnight processing uh, utilizing protocol number one, an open system without vacuum. So alcoholic formalin, um, so the tissues, uh, it put in alcoholic formalin for three hours, then again for one hour, and then again for another hour of that alcoholic formalin. Uh, then uh, it's put in 95% alcohol for an hour, and then again that 95% alcohol for one hour, then an hour and a half in absolute alcohol, another hour and a half of absolute alcohol, uh, then one hour of xylene, and then another hour of xylene, then 30 minutes of paraffin, then an hour and a half of paraffin, and then another hour of paraffin. So that is an example of protocol one. This is an example of a routine overnight processing utilizing protocol number two, a closed system with heat and vacuum. So <clears throat> it's put in 10% um, formalin uh, for two hours at 35 degrees Celsius utilizing a vacuum, then an hour and a half of alcoholic formalin uh, with no heat or no vacuum, uh, then an hour of alcoholic formalin again with no heat and no vacuum, then an hour of 95% alcohol utilizing just the vacuum, then 45 minutes of 95% uh, alcohol utilizing no heat or vacuum, then 45 minutes of absolute alcohol with the vacuum, then an hour of absolute alcohol um, with no heat or vacuum, and then an hour of xylene, no heat or vacuum, and then an hour of xylene using the vacuum, then 30 minutes of paraffin with no vacuum use, then an additional hour of paraffin, no vacuum, 
and then an hour and a half of paraffin again, um, utilizing just the vacuum. So that's protocol two. So this is an example of a routine overnight processing that utilizes protocol number three, um, which utilizes a vacuum and heat only used with paraffin. So this protocol is excellent for needle biopsy specimens. So 15 minutes of 70% alcohol, then an additional 15 minutes and 95% alcohol, 15 minutes again and 95% alcohol, 15 minutes, two steps of 15 minutes of absolute alcohol, and then two steps of uh, xylene for 15 minutes each, and then three steps of paraffin at 15 minutes each. So that is protocol uh, number three, overnight processing. So what are some problems that can occur while processing tissues with an open processor? And now the cassette baskets can be accidentally put down into the paraffin instead of the solution uh, that begins the processing. Uh, if this happens, uh, you need to remove the basket from the paraffin um, and then remove each cassette from that basket and let them cool down. Once it's cooled, the paraffin will be solid. And at that point, um, each cassette should be opened up and um, the paraffin should be peeled off the tissue sample. After all the paraffin is removed, uh, put that tissue back into a fresh cassette and you can reprocess it. Another thing that can happen is after the infiltration process, that cassette basket can go past their paraffin and back into the fixative solution. If this happens, the tissue should be reprocessed through all solutions, starting with 95% alcohol or absolute alcohol. The cassette baskets can also hang up in the air. If they've been in the air for a lengthy time before the infiltration of the paraffin, the tissue may have to be rehydrated and then soaked in a fluid that is formulated to reconstitute dried tissue. It must, uh, it must soak for eight to 12 hours and then the tissue can be processed routinely. Now, if the reagent level is low or empty in the processor, uh, the tissue, the part of the tissue that isn't immersed in that reagent uh, may potentially dry out. If this drying out happens, it of course has to be rehydrated. Um, this can be done in a fluid that is formulated to reconstitute dried tissue. Problems will occur if the order of solutions is accidentally mixed up, so the tissue is put in solutions out of order. To correct for this, the tissue may have to be backed up to alcohol and then completely reprocessed. Um, so what are some problems that can occur while processing tissues with a closed processor? So if dehydration of a tissue has begun in any other solution of alcohol that is more concentrated than 70%, um, the buffering salts used in formalin solutions may precipitate out and clog the fluid filters or tubing. So to prevent this, after immersion and buffered formalin solution, uh, 60 to 70 percent alcohols must be first um, uh, must be used as the first dehydration solution. If limonene is selected as a clearing agent, a greasy residue may coat the tissue chamber and fluid delivery lines. Xylene should be used for the cleaning cycle after paraffin uh, to clean that out. Now, if zinc formalin is used, the pH must remain below 7. If it becomes higher than 7, it may precipitate in the tubing. If this occurs, the tubing must be rinsed with a diluted acetic acid to remove it. Now, just like with the open processing system, if the order of solutions is accidentally mixed up in the closed system, um, the, the, so the tissue is put in solutions out of order. Um, so to correct this, the tissue may have to be backed up to alcohol and then completely reprocessed. And lastly, if formalin has condensed on the inner surface of the lid of the processing chamber, so this will create droplets that are introduced into the infiltration paraffins, and this results in an uneven H&E stain. If the paraffin blocks are cut too thick, they will be inadequately uh, processed. So if this occurs, it takes around two to four hours to resolve. The tissue must first be soaked in xylene on a rotator for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, this helps to remove any residual paraffin wax. Then the cassettes must be placed in tetrahydrofuran, which is a universal solvent. Um, so this is placed on the rotator uh, for 30 to 90 minutes. This dehydrates and then clears the tissue. And at the end of this step, the tissue should be uh, transparent. Then the sections must be placed in xylene for 10 minutes to ensure that it's been properly cleared. 
The sections are then put on tissue uh, on the tissue processor and infiltrated with two to three fresh changes of uh, paraffin for 30 to 45 minutes each. And at this point, the tissue can then be re-embedded. Now the next embedding media we're going to talk about um, are water soluble waxes. So these are usually referred to as carbo wax and are solid uh, polyethylene glycols. Uh, it infiltrates tissue directly from aqueous fixatives without the need for dehydration and clearing. Fat will not be dissolved because of this, although it will not infiltrate tissue um, that has large amounts of fat and um, central nervous system tissue requires longer periods of time for it to properly infiltrate. Any well-fixed tissue is suitable for use with carbo wax. Usually three changes of wax for a total time of three hours are recommended for infiltration with water-soluble waxes. Tissue that is embedded in this medium will be softer than if it were embedded in paraffin. The greatest problem that occurs when using water-soluble waxes for an embedding medium is uh, something called the floating out of sections. So this is when sections dissolve in the flotation bath, which causes disintegration of the tissue. Various formulated flotation solutions have been made to prevent this from happening. And just like with paraffin wax, carbo wax uh, should be cut when it is chilled. With carbo wax, it must be chilled in the refrigerator because it is soluble in water. Uh, carbo, wa carbo wax is also uh, something called hygroscopic, and this means that it will absorb moisture from the air. So to prevent this from happening, it must be stored in sealed polyethylene bags with a small amount of desiccant present within them. Like paraffin and water-soluble waxes, saloidin is another embedding media. Saloidin is a generic term for any type of nitrocellulose compound that is used for embedding in the histopathology laboratory. The most commonly used um, is called parlodian, although it is usually just used in research and neuropathology laboratories. To prepare saloidin media for use, parlodian is softened with absolute alcohol and an equal volume of ether is added to it. The mixture is then inverted to be mixed. Uh, heat isn't required in any of the processing steps for embedding with saloidin. Um, because of this, shrinkage and hardening of the tissue is really minimal. It does take, uh, does take weeks or even months to complete, however, and it is hazardous because of the use of ether. Again, this method is not uh, really used much at all. Plastics can also be used as embedding media. Uh, the two used are glycol methyl acrylate, or GMA, and epoxy resins. Uh, GMA is an acrylic resin that can be mixed with water. After the, after the tissue has been dehydrated with 95% alcohol, infiltration can occur. GMA provides great support for very hard tissue, especially undecalcified bone segments. It is a particularly good embedding medium for uh, kidney, bone marrow, and lymph node biopsy specimens. When cutting specimens embedded in GMA, a glass knife must be used. Tissues that are embedded with GMA are receptive to some enzyme techniques, but generally do not stain well because the embedding media is not removed from those tissue sections. It doesn't adhere well to glass slides either. When using GMA embedding in media, it should be performed under a hood as the chemicals that are used are considered hazardous. Like GMA, epoxy resins are also another plastic that are uh, used as embedding media. These do require dehydration of the specimen and require the use of a transitional fluid unless they are able to be mixed with ethanol. A transitional fluid works the same as a clearing agent is used in uh, the paraffin process. Uh, propylene oxide is used most frequently as the transitional fluid for this technique. Um, uh, Aerodite, epin, and spur are the most commonly used epoxy resins for the embedding process. Epoxy resin embedding is required for electron microscopy samples. This is because this technique allows good resolution of very thin sections. The chemicals used for this technique can cause contact dermatitis, so contact with the skin must be prevented when using it. Agar and gelatin can also be used as embedding medium. Uh, it can be used to produce a single block of friable tissue or it can be used for multiple tissue fragments when cutting frozen sections. It can be used in the uh, double impregnation procedure. So in this procedure, the tissue is first infiltrated with the agar and gelatin 
again, and then the block is fixed, processed, and infiltrated again, but this time with uh, paraffin wax. Using 30% sucrose as an embedding media is great for getting frozen sections from unprocessed tissue that is fixed with formalin. Sucrose is called a cryoprotectant, which means that it prevents tissue from getting damaged from the freezing process. Both H&E and uh, fat stains are easily done with tissues that have embedded, been embedded with 30% sucrose material. So now that we've talked about media that is used for embedding, let's talk about embedding and the orientation of the specimen in the embedding medium. So embedding can also be called casting or blocking. And this process describes surrounding the tissue and the infiltration medium that is used for the processing of said tissue. Then uh, that medium is allowed to become solid. The way that the specimen is oriented uh, within the embedding medium is the most crucial part of the embedding process. Improper orientation of the tissue may ruin tissue during microtomy. And microtomy is when a uh, tissue is cut into thin sections for examination under a microscope uh, using a microtome. So if it is improperly positioned, uh, when the specimen is cut, the tissue may be improperly cut and ruin uh, that specimen. Usually the side that is to be cut is placed down into the embedding mold, and if the tissue cannot be flipped over for whatever reason and the incorrect side is placed down into the embedding mold, it can either be uh, notched or marked. Uh, so this is done by notching a V lightly into the mold or marking it um, with either India ink or tattoo ink. An example of this is here on the next slide. So this is an example in Dr. Carson's book of how specimens can be marked. So the specimen labeled A, which is um, on the left hand side of the picture, uh, shows that that V uh, that is notched on the top of the block surface. So that tells um, the histologist or the pathologist uh, what what is the top of the, the, um, the block. So um, the specimen that's labeled B here shows what an ink mark looks like to show the top of the block surface. So again, this can be done with tattoo ink or India ink. While the specimen is being oriented and chilled, it's critical that the entire specimen has light pressure applied to it. This ensures that the tissue will be embedded flat within the embedding media. If a specimen is not embedded flat, this will prevent it from being properly sectioned. Hard tissues, like bones, must be placed diagonally within the embedding medium. If hard tissue is embedded diagonally, the knife of the microtome will first cut into a smaller area of tissue and will reach a greater surface area of tissue uh, slowly instead of hitting that larger part of the tissue at once. And this allows for that specimen to be cut much uh, more easily. The photo on the left-hand side of this slide shows a patient's brain tissue that was embedded improperly. Light pressure was not applied over the entire specimen while it was being embedded and chilled, resulting in the specimen not being embedded flat. So the darker area at the top of the specimen suggests that the area has not been sectioned. So the blue color of this tissue specimen is caused by an indicator desiccant in the absolute alcohol. The photo on the right hand part of this slide shows a properly positioned and embedded bone specimen. Microtomy of bone is substantially easier to do when the bone is placed diagonally in the embedding medium. And of course, this is uh, because the knife of the microtome will contact only a small surface area at first, and this will create better sectioning. If embedding a tissue that has a wall, it must be embedded so that all the layers of the tissue are visible uh, in the block. These are tissues like gallbladder, uh, cyst tissue, and tissues of the gastrointestinal tract. Tissues that have tubular structures like the appendix and fallopian tubes must be embedded in cross section so that their lumen and all the mucosal and external muscle layers are visible. Skin specimens need to be embedded so the epidermis or epithelium is facing uh, one side of the mold. Um, if more than one piece of skin is to be embedded in the same block, uh, the epidermis of each specimen should be facing the same side of the mold. If multiple small pieces of tissue are to be embedded within the same mold, they need to be arranged in a line that is parallel to the longer axis of the mold, not just randomly placed about within the embedding mold. Proper alignment ensures that the pathologist does not miss a single piece of tissue when examining the tissue block. 
Also, tissue should be placed in the center of the embedding mold. This allows for proper ribboning of the specimen. Now let's look at some picture examples of what we've been discussing here. So the picture on the left hand side of this slide shows an embedding block that has two pieces of small intestine that are properly embedded. They are embedded on a diagonal and have all the mucosal surfaces facing the same direction. The photo on the right hand side uh, shows two blocks that are properly embedded. Um, the block on the left uh, shows three sections of a patient's appendix and the block on the right shows cross sections of fallopian tubes. So these are correct. The photo on the left hand side uh, of the slide here shows proper embedding of multiple tissue pieces in the same block. Um, the one on the left shows a block that contains four lymph nodes. The block on the right shows one that has multiple specimens from the same gastrointestinal site. When embedding uh, multiple pieces in the same block, the pieces should not be just randomly put into the block, but should be embedded in a line. And of course, this ensures that the pathologist does not miss a piece of tissue. The photo on the right hand side of this slide shows improper embedding of multiple pieces of tissue in the same block. See how the pieces are just randomly placed without any order whatsoever. So this is incorrect and can cause that pathologist to miss a piece of tissue when evaluating this block. This photo shows a piece of tissue that is not properly centered within the embedding block. So there is an improper paraffin margin here at the top of the block. You see how there's just not enough space there and needs to be centered here. Um, so this makes ribbons, uh, ribboning uh, much more difficult to produce on this block. So this is incorrect. Uh, these specimens need to be centered within the middle of the uh, embedding block. In general, a good practice when embedding is to only open and embed one cassette at a time. It's also good practice to wipe the forceps used for embedding between each block. This helps to prevent something called forceps metastasis. So this is when tissue fragments are transferred from one tissue block to another tissue block, which can lead to a misdiagnosis of a patient. The utilization of embedding quality control is also very important in the histopathology lab. The number of tissue pieces submitted in each cassette should be recorded. Many histopathology laboratories use the letter M to denote multiple or N to denote numerous when recording more than four to five tissue pieces in the same cassette. There are two special techniques used in processing, decalcification and frozen sectioning. Decalcification removes calcium from the bone or tissue. It is performed between the steps of fixation and dehydration. Frozen sectioning is performed when a rapid diagnosis is needed or if a particular tissue might be adversely affected by routine processing. And we'll talk about both of these special techniques here now. Un unless there is a specific study where undecalcification is requested, tissues that contain calcium must be de decalcified before the tissue is embedded. Tissues that contain uh, calcium can't be sectioned after they are embedded in paraffin. Um, plastic embedding media must be used if undecalcified studies are requested. This generally occurs when metabolic bone disease is being diagnosed. Tissue must be completely fixed before undergoing decalcification. Um, and there are two methods of decalcification, um, acid methods and chelating methods. The stronger the acid and the longer the tissue remains in the acid, the more the subsequent stain will demonstrate effects of the decalcification process. The most noticeable effect is on the tissue's nuclear basophilia. Over decalcification can cause a total lack of staining of the nucleus in the tissue sample. With the uh, acid method of decalcification, calcium salts dissolve and then ionize. The way in which these calcium ions are removed from the tissue sample is the basis of the differing acid methods. Hydrochloric acid and nitric acids uh, decalcify tissue very quickly, so it must be monitored very uh, closely. Formic acid is slower acting than nitric and hydrochloric acids at the decalcification process. It is a great method for the simultaneous fixation and decalcification of tissue. There are some electrolyte, uh, electrolytic acid methods for decalcification as well. Uh, these use a mixture of both formic acid and hydrochloric acid uh, that are placed in an electroplating device. 
the calcium ions are attracted away from the specimen in this method. And this usually takes around two to six hours to complete. So those are the acid methods of decalcification. Chelating agents can also be used. Now these are organic compounds that bind calcium ions. Ethylene diamine uh, tetraacetic acid, that's a, that's a hard word, <laughs> or EDTA, right? We always say EDTA at lab. We never use the long word for it. Uh, so EDTA is used in solution to bind calcium ions. So EDTA is actually the additive that we use for certain venipuncture blood tubes. So it chelates the calcium, so it binds to the calcium. And because calcium is a part of the coagulation cascade, it prevents the blood from clotting in that tube. So if you work in medical laboratory technology or phlebotomy, you know all about EDTA. So it's the same thing here. It's binding calcium. The end point of decalcification is the most important part of the decalcification process. And this is because under decalcified tissue will be hard to section and over decalcified tissue will stain badly. So there are three different methods of determining the endpoint of decalcification for tissues, mechanical, chemical, and radiography. To test the endpoint of decalcification using mechanical methods, the flexibility of the tissue specimen is assessed, as is probing the specimen with a needle and also scraping the surfaces of the section. This is a pretty subjective method and also can cause the damage um, of the tissue, so it's not recommended. Chemical methods include adding a decalcification or decalcifying fluid. If after 30 minutes after that fluid is added, if there is turbidity, this means that there is calcium still present within that sample. The most accurate way to determine the endpoint of decalcification is by taking an X-ray um, of it to see if there is any calcium present within the sample. Now, after the specimen is fully decalcified properly, it should be washed to remove any excess acid. The photo on the left-hand side of this screen shows a section of bone that has been properly decalcified. There are no artifacts visible here. The photo on the right-hand side of the slide shows what happens when a sample is under decalcified. So this purple object here, so this here, this purple, um, <clears throat> is um, the result of um, calcium remaining in the tissue. So this makes sectioning harder and can damage the edges of the knife uh, when cutting. So this is um, under decalcification. Now the photo on the left hand side of the screen is a bone section that has been H&E stained. And this is an example of a properly decalcified specimen. Note that the nuclear basophilia is preserved. The red and white blood cell lines can be easily distinguished here. So red cells, okay, and then white blood cells here, okay. So this is uh, properly uh, decalcified. Uh, now the photo on the right hand side of the slide shows a bone section that has been H&E stained as well. But the difference is this specimen has not been appropriately decalcified. It has been over decalcified. So there is no nuclear staining because of this. This photo is a great example of bone dust artifact. So this occurs when bone debris is pressed into the bone surface by the saw. Um, this can be prevented by using a saw with a diamond blade. And this blade allows thin sections to be cut without debris um, or bone. The frozen section procedure is a method of processing when there needs to be a rapid microscopic analysis of a tissue specimen. It's most frequently used in oncology uh, surgeries, so which is um, a surgery of potentially cancerous tumors. So frozen sections must be used when fat needs to be demonstrated in the sample. And all fixatives, with the exception of osmium tetroxide, allow fat to dissolve during processing. So that's why frozen is used, because <clears throat> it, it can preserve the fat. So frozen sections must also be used for various enzyme and immunohistochemical techniques. This is because heat and fixation and processing, which does not occur in frozen sectioning, um, inactivate most enzymes and antigens present in the sample. 
So we'll talk about cryostats in our upcoming instrumentation lecture, uh, but tissue can be frozen in the cryostat. But this is a slow process and ice crystals can form in and on the tissue sample. If uh, skeletal muscle is frozen in this uh, for subsequent enzyme techniques, the holes that form render it useless, render just that, that sample useless for those techniques. Some cryostats have heat extractors to prevent this, uh, but the best frozen sections are obtained using isopentane and liquid nitrogen. If just liquid nitrogen is used for it, gas bubbles prevent freezing, so a container of isopentane is lowered into the liquid nitrogen for this technique. And we'll talk more about this in our enzyme histochemistry lecture. Now the photo on the left side here shows skeletal muscle fibers in a cross section. So this is an H&E stained frozen section. Uh, this is properly frozen in isopentane and liquid nitrogen at a temperature of negative 150 degrees Celsius. The photo on the right hand side is a frozen section of skeletal muscle fibers that shows ice crystal artifact. So see these holes here, All right? That's caused by the ice crystal artifact. Um, so this is a method, um, this method of freezing was, was not proper because that artifact occurred. All right, so that ends our lecture on processing in the histology laboratory. If this video helped you, go ahead and give it a like, and please remember to subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'll happily answer them for you. Until next time.